Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And welcome back, everybody, and Happy New Year. I hope it's warmer than wherever you are than it here. it's been here in Washington, D.C., as we expect yet another snowstorm tonight. Heaven forbid. Um, um, we're very excited about this program. Um, uh, just to underscore, the program in February will be our second deep dive. Um, and we, it's a big chunk of time. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to participate, be sure to hold enough hours because it, it's long, but it should be very, very exciting. Um, we have a very busy day today. Um, uh, we, we're thrilled and we would remind you to help us going forward. We have a very interesting sort of known unknown, unknown known um, uh, to present as well as additional cases from Dr. Farrow. So uh, we will go straight to 4.30. We do have a hard stop at 4.30. Uh, uh, but most important, just welcome back. So it is now my huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Farrow. Um, Emily um, has a unique and uh, wonderful background. Uh, she started out in genetic counseling and from everything I can figure out and for, from her extraordinary CV, um, really said, I've got to go further. Um, and so that she went on to get her PhD in medical and molecular genetics. And she is now serving as associate professor uh, at the University of Missouri School of Medicine uh, and is the director of laboratory uh, operations. So uh, we have an exciting day today and it's great to have you back. Emily, you're on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me make sure I can navigate Zoom and share the right screen with everyone. And we'll get... Okay, I think we have the right one shared. Looks good, thank you. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'm really excited. Um, thank you for letting me be a part of this really excellent series and to share um, some of our experiences and knowledge on genomics and how we're applying that in rare disease and in, in skeletal dysplasias. Um, so today I'll talk about emerging diagnostic technologies. And maybe we'll move the slides. All right, so the, the Genomic Medicine Center at Children's Mercy was one of the first genome centers that was wholly embedded within a pediatric setting. Um, and this was really largely due to the recognition that rare disease is really collectively not all that rare. And so there, we now know there are about 7,700 genetic inherited diseases. They're affecting 400 million people globally. That's about one in 10 Americans, of which 50% are children. And if we look at the latest nosology from 2019 on skeletal dysplasias, there's about 461 different recognized skeletal dysplasias. Um, However, when we look at our molecular diagnostic yields by symptom-driven clinical exome sequencing in patients, uh, that really is only ranging from 30 to 40%. So if you really cherry pick the population that you're sequencing, you can push that number higher. But I think in general, that, that's a pretty solid number around, it's really more around the 30%. And we also know that the addition of currently short read genome sequencing is really only incrementally increasing that diagnostic yield. So it's not like we can run a genome on someone and suddenly now our diagnostic rate is 80%. So we still have quite a bit to go. And so one of the reasons that I have a job, one of the reasons I'm excited about genomics and I'm here today is that the field of genomics and genetics is a bit like Midwest weather, although now it's kind of just weather. And that one day on Christmas Eve, it might be 70 degrees. And then 10 days later, it's negative 10 with snow on the ground. So it changes every day and it can be difficult to keep up. But I think it's important to keep perspective. And if we look back at where we started, it was only really in 1865 that Mendel published his results. It was in 1953 that we had the DNA uh, double helix structure that was published. It was after that, which I think we should all remember that we found the correct human chromosome number, so we had it wrong for a while. It was in 1977 that Sanger sequencing was published. And to this day, this really remains the gold standard for genetic sequencing, and I'll go over why that is. Uh, the Human Genome Project was complete, completed in 2001. It may be the only government project that came in on time and under budget. 
Um, in 2016, we could do a single human genome though. It took over 10 years for so the first one. By 2016, we could do in 26 hours. That's been pushed even faster now. In 2017 though, we could now do 60 genomes in three days on a single instrument. And uh, now over the past year, what is really exciting, what we've been spending a lot of time on is now we can do long read sequencing or these third generation sequencing um, technologies. And so I don't know how many of you follow the industry, but typically at JP Morgan, which is in a couple of weeks, is when uh, all the industry leaders will announce their greatest, newest, greatest toys. And so I think we'll know in a few weeks what we might see in 2022 that comes out. But as we stand on kind of the shoulders of our uh, genetic um, forefathers, we can see and we now know that the human genome has 3.2 billion base pairs or 6.4 billion nucleotides. And if we were gonna try to replicate our, that ourselves, it would be equal to typing 60 words a minute, eight hours a day for 50 years, right? It's a phenomenal amount of information. Of those 3.2 base pairs, um, there, it encodes about 19,000 genes, which is really only one to 2% of the genome. And those genes encode about 100,000 proteins. And so when we look at that, um, you can also flip that around and say, gosh, there's over 95% of the genome that we still have a lot to learn about. When we think of our genome, um, and though one of the things that makes us unique is our genetic variation. And when we look at what we've known about the genome and what we're learning, and then we put that in the context of disease, we know there's not just one type of genetic variation or differences, right? And so these are things we have to keep in mind when we're trying to make a diagnosis or right, do the right test, is that our variation um, can differ in size, it sure differs in location, the impact on an individual codon or amino acid, there's variation on the protein then, how is the protein, and then ultimately, how do all of these changes impact the protein expression of that gene to give us a phenotype? Or maybe it gives us a protective phenotype. That's the other thing that we need to remember. Not all variation is bad. So if we were sitting in a room, uh, what I like to tell people, um, again, when we think about genetic variation and the scope of that, and as we think about testing, the difference between us is only 0.5%. So I would say, look to your neighbor to the right, and maybe you're really happy with them today, and you can say, gosh, I'm 99.5% like that person to the right. So maybe look at the, the Zoom screen right above you. But maybe this morning, you know, someone cut you off in traffic or, you know, someone didn't take the trash out of your house and, and you're not too fond of them, that 0.5% still means that you're 16 million base pairs different between that other person. So we just have an enormous amount of information that we need um, to sift through when we're thinking about diagnostics. And within that 0.5%, um, what how do we bucket that variation? And really 0.3 to 0.4% of that are copy number variants. So these could be big insertions or deletions of information or rearrangements. So think of balanced translocations. And then a smaller fraction of those are these small insertions and deletions in single nucleotide variants. And here below, I just kind of put for our reference, the central dogma of here, our DNA gets transcribed to RNA, which goes to protein. And so we really always have to think about, well, not just do we have a DNA change, but ultimately what is that DNA change doing? And so again, another context to remember, and especially when we think about emerging technologies, is that we have differences in our genomic variation, but we also have differences in the mechanisms of disease. And so particularly in rare disease, but also we can say the same thing about um, skeletal dysplasias, is that there are really different ways that we can have a disease um, mechanism. So it could be single nucleotide, as I mentioned, we have copy number variants, we have expansion disorders. So I think the classic one that people think of is maybe Fragile X, uh, where we have a triplet repeat that gets longer and causes disease. We have methylation disorders. So this is how is that protein being expressed? Uh, we have the structural variation. And again, we can't forget that we also have mitochondrial variation and that often gets overlooked, I think. So all of these things are what we have to think about in our diagnostic and testing strategies. And so, in rare disease and in skeletal dysplasia, though, when we're thinking about all the variation that I just mentioned, we have to think about, well, how are we going to do this testing? And in some cases, knowing which tests to go to um, can be really straightforward and you know exactly where to go. So it might be that you um, have a, a newborn baby and you look at them and you really strongly suspect that this baby has trisomy 21 and you know, gosh, I'm going to start with the karyotype and you're probably going to be right. But in other areas, um, it might be, especially if we think about neonatal hypotonia 
or I, I think increasingly, um, and maybe in some bonus, um, bonus orders, it's more difficult to know where am I going to start with my testing? So do I want to do array or sequencing or expansion? And you get these algorithms that can take time and money. And so we have, you know, currently it takes a lot of assays and it takes a lot of time to get all of these things um, sequenced or to really think that you look at it. And even if you lived in a world where you didn't have to worry about insurance and billing and getting it sent out, if you went concurrently straight through, it could still take you several weeks um, to get the right testing algorithm done. So luckily we're getting better at this. Um, and so we have a, a nice progression of testing. And so Sanger PCR, as I mentioned, um, is our gold standard in sequencing still to this day. And if we're doing a confirmation, this is the thing that we fall back on the most in our laboratory from our genome sequencing. But what this is, is gene by gene, exon by exon sequencing. So you can get fancy and you can multiplex and do some small panels. You can do more than one exon at a time if you know how to put them together. But this is still very time consuming, particularly on the lab laboratory technician side. Um, and I think the biggest caveat to Sanger sequencing is that it's limited to knowns. So you have to know where you want to sequence, you have to know the sequence of where you are, and you really have to know what you're expecting for the change. Um, so it's not, you can't um, just do Sanger agnostically to find what you're looking for. The trade-off though, and the reason that it's a gold standard is that the results are quite clear. So here we have the father of a patient. And if we look at those ACs, Gs, and Ts, and we read along, we can see right here at this position, we have a C to T change. So it's very clear that there's a variant there that we don't see in our negative control that matches the reference, right? So there's no doubt what these um, DNA changes are. And that's why it becomes the gold standard. So, but with the completion of the human genome project, we have technologies and really what we mean that permit the rapid interrogation of DNA up to and including the entire genome via massively parallel sequencing. So we're no longer doing one exon at a time, we're just going to sequence it all at once. And again, this really took shape with the completion of the human genome project. And again, this is really just used to, to uh, emphasize the distinction from the initial approaches um, of one strand, one sequence at a time. And what we've seen is that decreasing costs and comparatively rapid results are creating a paradigm shift, particularly monogenic disease. So here, when we talk about this Moore's law, you've probably seen it in different ways, um, not always cartoonish, but I think the one thing to, to think about is that we've seen a dramatic increase in throughput, a dramatic decrease in cost. So you can sequence more faster. We can do more with our compute. But the one thing that often gets um, forgotten is that people don't follow Moore's law. So at least in my household and most households, we are not following this when it comes to my amount of time and reimbursement. So one thing to think about when we think about testing. This is one of my um, favorite um, illustrations that we use quite a bit and we lean on and that's because I like the way it illustrates the relationship of size and structural variation uh, to the, the method of sequencing that we're looking at. So again, if we think of these large aneuploidies, they take up the most space, right? Because their whole chromosome changes, they are the um, happen the least frequently or they're the least tolerated because of the amount of information. Um, but again, you're gonna match that up and do a karyotype. And then as we come down to these copy number um, and smaller insertions and deletions, and single nucleotide variant, you can see here where we used to have the different assays. And uh, what's happening rapidly now is that genomic sequencing is able to actually to detect all of those insertions, deletions, and copy numbers. So it's starting to fill in to where maybe you don't need a microarray if you don't have to worry about your reimbursement um, because you can get that from your exome sequencing. And so here in our DNA changes, again, if we just think about the different types, we have the single nucleotide variants that can be common or rare. Uh, they happen the most frequently, about one to, uh, they happen about one in every 100 to 300 nucleotides. Um, and then we have our smaller insertions and deletions that can be up to 100 nucleotides, but really these small indels are about 10 base pairs up to our copy number variants that are the least frequent, but again, larger. And if we think about genome or next generation sequencing, we're really good at the single nucleotide variants. Again, that's our bread and butter. And then actually these large copy number gains and losses are pretty easy, uh, really easy to see with next gen. It's kind of this donut hole of these middle ones that are a little bit more difficult to detect, but we're doing a much better job. And I, I would add that this donut hole here exists across technologies, right? So you have a gap in what your microarray is catching to for copy number changes. <laughs> 
So what are some of the different sequencing technologies and how um, do they operate at the same and different to help you when you're thinking about both your research and clinical um, sequencing needs? And so in general, while there's different companies and different technologies, really right now, I would advocate that you could bucket these into kind of two um, regions. One is short read technology and one is long read technology. Um, and we're gonna go over the pros and cons of both. Uh, but in general, there's a balance between the read length, the error rate and the cost per base. Overwhelmingly, currently, if you go look at databases, the majority of current sequences has been generated with short read technology. So um, if you just wanna guess, guess short read right now. And that's because we have low error rates. Again, it's, it's cheap and it's fast. But these third generation sequencers, these long reads, the scales are beginning to tip. Um, and so they allow for more complete variant detection analyses. The error rates are now low. They weren't at the beginning. Uh, the cost is decreasing, but they're really slow. So no one's gonna do it. I, very fast genome that's long read right now. So any, again, what's nice is that roughly of the technology, um, regardless of how you're sequencing, we have kind of the same dogma of how your samples are gonna flow and things, to, considerations to go through. So you're gonna start with your sample. We're gonna walk through a, a preparation step on, on the lab side. If you're doing a genome, that's really all you have to do is this quick prep where you're gonna um, do library and you go to sequencing. If you wanna do anything less than the full genome, the uh, panel, or you wanna do an exome, then we have to do this kind of sidestep of enrichment and then you get down to sequencing. So we'll go over what these are. Uh, but I like to point this out because if you've ever look at all the studies that do rapid sequencing, they always have genomes and that's because the sample prep is so fast, even though you're sequencing more. So again, as I mentioned, while there are subtle differences, really the first step of our library preparation is to add primers and barcodes. So barcodes are just like what they sound like. If you go to Target and you have a barcode to identify something, we add barcodes to identify the DNA and each person gets a barcode. The primers are just what we need to put the sequences, the DNA on the instruments. Uh, so it basically gives a start signal to the instruments of where to start sequencing. Um, in short read sequencing, the process involves fragmenting the DNA. This is done randomly. Um, and it, this is where the term, if you've ever heard, it's not used too often now, is shotgun sequencing. Um, and that's because you're gonna break the DNA up into thousands of pieces um, randomly. And we're gonna aim for about 400 base pairs. So that's what a short read will be. So after the end of library, everyone gets their own barcode. Um, everyone has the, the primers that tell the instrument where to sequence. And again, then we're ready for sequencing. That takes about four hours in the lab. If we're gonna do anything else, when any of your gene panels or exome panels, we're gonna do an enrichment step. And this takes quite a bit longer. So again, the reason we would do an enrichment is so that we could select out the regions of interest using capture probes. And we do this for cost and time considerations. So we are after you get your um, samples barcoded, you can mix them together. So now we can have pools of samples that are much more um, efficient in the laboratory side. It allows us to sequence the areas we're interested in deeper. So if we're looking at less landscape, we can look at it in more detail is really the way to think of it. And um, collectively for the group, we're faster and it has less cost. Um, for the sample for if we do an enrichment. Um, in many cases, people will pursue um, enrichment or panel testing too, because they don't wanna deal with the off target sequencing that you might get. So if you put your clinical hat on, you don't wanna know what the status is for um, a gene that's not relevant to the to phenotype in front of you. And so if you don't even sequence it, you don't have to look at it. And this is just a, a quick metric to show how you do this. So we have the areas that we wanna sequence. Um, here, so these are the, the exons of the gene we're interested in. We just designed complementary DNA um, sequences, short um, oligos, we call them, or baits. These baits um, we're able to pull down with a magnetic bead. And so we're going to bind these together because they're complementary. And after they've been bound together, we can use a magnet and we'll pull down everything attached to these. And then all these areas that we didn't sequence. So the intron, these energetic regions, we didn't target them. They're not attached to a bait and they'll just get washed out. And so we won't have them in our, our capture pool that we need to sequence. So what does that look like though? I say that we do less sequencing or we can do more. So if you do a panel of about 571 genes, so TaxCam was a panel we ran internally, that's only about 2.5 gigabase of data. An exome, again, 19,000 genes takes about eight to 12 gigabase of data. If you wanna do everything, you wanna do the whole genome, that's 90 gigabase of data as a minimum. So you can see how you rapidly are scaling up the amount of data that you need to analyze and move back and forth. 
Things to keep in mind though, is that enrichment means you're not sequencing something uh, and there could be a trade-off because now we've added some more laboratory time. Um, and so you might have areas that don't sequence as well or that are really difficult to see. So just because you say you're sequencing the whole exome doesn't mean that you're getting every base in the whole exome. So I'm not going to, to really harp on this at all, but just to know how um, the sequencing is done on the short read um, platforms. And here, this is actually a nice link that you can go look at later. Um, but really, we're sequencing this base by a base, single base at a time. It's called sequencing by synthesis. So you add one fluorescent nucleotide, you image that nucleotide, then you add the next one. And that's how we're doing our sequencing on the short reads. We're going to do those um, about 150 base pairs. So your short read fragments, about 400 base pairs. And we're going to sequence about um, 150 on each end of that. So relatively short when you think about the scheme of your DNA or the size of our DNA. So really the critical part of is bioinformatics. Um, and so here I, I will freely tell you, I'm really good on the sample prep sequencing side and then I'm, I can help you with your analysis. I am not a bioinformatician. I know just enough to be dangerous. And so we use, um, there's a critical need for bioinformatics and, and we are using both a combination of custom and commercial software solutions. But one of the things I want to point out is how we're doing the, the resequencing and alignment of reads to the reference genome, because this is really the critical difference between short and long read sequencing. Um, and here is that the first step you have to do is that we have to take uh, on yellow on top, let me take a step back, is our reference sequence that we have from the Human Genome Project. And down below, we have each sequencing read, those 150 base pairs. So when you have those 150 base pairs, the first thing you have to do is align that back to the genome and find out where you were. So we're gonna align our DNA, our fragments to it. And then once we do that, then we're gonna go through and we're gonna call and we're gonna basically throughout the genome, we're gonna say, this is reference or now we see a variance, right? But we know that we have millions of variants in there. And so then what we have to do after that is we have to characterize that variant and say, well, do we care? Does it have an impact or do we not? Um, and so the, the biggest caveat is that if you only have 150 base pairs, it can sometimes be difficult to know where that sequence came from. So think about if you ever have to copy over the numbers in uh, like your bank account uh, number, it usually has a bunch of zeros at the beginning, it's really easy to get lost. If you think about the repetitive DNA and your sequence, when you have a short read, it's easy to not know where it goes. So this is also important when you think about pseudogenes or um, repetitive regions. And that really is the limitation in the short read sequencing. So even with that, if we look the sensitivity and specificity for single nucleotide variants in our hands, if we use a Coriel sample that has a, a true set of samples is over 99%. So we're still really good. And we can get those insertions and deletions up to 40 base pairs. And that's not just true for our lab. Those are just the metrics I have. Um, and again, the copy number de variant detection is continually improving. And so if it's big, it's easy. If it's smaller, it can be more difficult to detect. So how does this play against this third generation sequencing um, technologies that we have or the long read sequencing? And what are some of the reasons that we might look to long reads and what benefits can they have? And so again, as I mentioned, there are lots of caveats when we think about those 150 base pair sequencing reads. Um, one would be the repetitive regions, so pseudogenes, also an expansion disorder. So if you have an expansion such as fragile X, or we have um, skeletal dysplasias that are caused by expansions, if you have a CGG repeat, for example, and that repeat is 500 base pairs long, well, that 150 base pair, you have no idea where it might fall within that. So you don't know what your repeat is. And while we're doing better with our, our structural variant copy number, we're still not great in short reads. Um, and so longer reads can help us address those structural variants, those deletions, duplications, we can start to see inversions and the translocations. And the other thing that's really exciting that I'll show you, when we think about our singleton analyses, so parents aren't always available for sequencing, right? And autosomal recessive disease still accounts for about 21% of modes of inheritance. If we don't have parents, but we see two variants, we don't know if those two variants are on the same chromosome or if they're in trans and separate. And if we have a long read though, then we're able to phase those two variants together. And so again, as I mentioned, if we start to change the technology, then we can start to uh, address some of these donut holes that we have. And so here, if we come back to our testing assays, if we're gonna revisit this, and now we have one, two, three, four, five different ways that we need to think about, 
If we think about our short read exome and genome sequencing, I um, will pretty confidently tell you that you can condense your sequencing and your microarray together technologically. Um, with our long reads, we actually can condense four of these, are starting to be able to condense four of these assays into a single one, um, at least on the research side. So this is why we're, we call it emerging, it's coming. So why is that? So again, the sample preparation is very similar. So here, again, you see we're fragmenting the DNA. This is our library prep and we go to sequencing. The difference though here, instead of 400 base pairs now is that we're gonna target 15,000 base pairs for our sequencing link. So that's a huge difference when we're thinking about how we're gonna align to the genome. And in fact, if you start to look at gene size, um, particularly outside of like the muscle uh, genes, um, many genes can be within this 15,000 base pairs, or we can get overlapping reads to where we can easily phase across an entire gene um, with these longer read sequences. So it's really exciting. So again, historically, long read sequencing has had terrible error rates. There was a new advancement in how we're doing that sequencing, and that's why we've been able to see this huge um, increase in that. And here what I'm showing you is that if we take these high fire or long read sequencing that we're doing uh, using PacBio instrumentation, um, and we compare that to a short read genome sequencing, we're actually getting higher sensitivity and specificity. Now keep in mind that these are both over 99%, neither one is performing badly, but it used to be before you would see your long reads you know, down in the gutter, and now it's doing much better. On top of that, we're able to see more variation. So if we look at the total amount of variants that are detected by long read sequencing compared to short reads, right, we see a dramatic increase. So this is the overall total. And so here's the duplications are about four or five times higher. We don't see inversions with short read sequencing. We do with the long read sequencing. Um, and again, the assertions and deletions. And so when we think about that 30 to 40% diagnostic rate using short read genome sequencing, you can start to see why we're excited because if you detect more variation, I think it's highly likely we're going to start to find the cause of variation. And so again, these are some of the ways that uh, the potential of long read sequencing, so phasing, copy number, expansion, and then also what's really starting to roll out and gain speed are, are the detection of native methylation differences. Um, so is something methylated or unmethylated to where we have a difference in expression? So this is important for imprinting disorders. It's important uh, for, um, especially if we think of neonatal hypotonia cases. So I have just a few kind of screenshots to show you what this looks like here um, to where if we um, are looking, this is a long read. So again, these are 15,000 base pairs and it's really messy. So what to show you though, is that we've had a, a singleton patient here that was diagnosed um, with Neiman Pick disease. Parents weren't available. Uh, clinically, they had the disease. So this was really a, a positive control for us. But here we can see one pathogenic variant on allele one on the top. And here we can see that we phased the second allele, uh, which was a known splicing change to, um, below. So we know that these are in trans. So this is just really exciting to be able to, to apply this technology um, to our, our patients where we don't have parents. This is a case of a, a patient um, in a re our research study. So CMH308 uh, is now an adult male um, that had a previous medical history of multiple knee and shoulder dislocations that had required surgical correction. So we never could find the cause of disorder. So this person um, is in their 50s now. But here what we are finally able to see with um, our long read sequencing is that we actually have an inversion in exon one of call 5A1. Um, and so, this would be, this is considered diagnostic, but you can see why if you only have 150 base pairs, we have no idea of the orientation. And looking for an inversion is not something that we would be able to do or know to go do clinically. It's something that we need to have kind of an agnostic approach um, of long read sequ genome sequencing to look at. The other thing that's important, so not only can we detect copy numbers, but I told you we could do that with short read sequencing, but what we can see here, um, is that we can determine the orientation. So much like we saw that we had an inversion, what we're able to see here is that we found the duplication on short read sequencing, but we didn't know whether it was in tandem or if it was inverted. And what you can see here in the long read sequencing, if you follow the arrows are all pointing the same direction here in this duplication is that, and get, indeed it was tandem, which means that this was really a VUS trending towards likely benign and not the answer for this family, but it allowed us to rule this out. <laughs> 
And then again, the detection of expansion disorders. And we for sure have known expansion disorders and skeletal dysplasias. Um, it's also very common um, in childhood hypotonia and ataxias. This is an example where we're able to replicate um, the expansion of a, a female that had a expansion for fragile X, so um, as a carrier. So at least in our hands, the clinical validation is, is currently underway, but you're actually going to see this. So there are other commercial companies that have um, are heavily invested in working quite heavily in the field of long read sequencing. So I think it's gonna begin to dramatically change um, the sequencing capabilities that you have for testing and research. And just to quickly uh, comment on the interpretation part, this is the last part that I have, um, is that you know, all of the sequencing is great in the technology, but really it hinges on, are you able to interpret this? Which uh, again, stands on our bioinformaticians. Um, and by finding my favorite quote is that, you know, variant interpretation is the equivalent of finding a needle in a stack of needles. So if we go back to that small panel of 571 genes, we on average have 8,000 variants per sample that need analysis. An exome may have 300,000 variants and a whole genome might have 4 million variants. And so we have to have ways that we can not only weed out what's common variation, what is benign variation, and then start to find what we think might be causative. And so I won't, I won't make you go through all the interpretation criteria, but just to, to point out that the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the Association of Molecular Pathology have established a framework for variant interpretation. Before this was done, labs were really left on their own and you could see quite a bit of discrepancy from laboratory to laboratory for interpretation. Um, and so that has uh, undergone significant improvement with that. Um, a discordance previously, you know, had been as high as 60%. Um, and now we have mechanis mechanisms where we're actively resolving those discrepancies using resources such as ClinVar and ClinGen. Um, the other uh, factor to look at are things that we can use as a resource um, are the HGMD, which catalogs um, reported variants. And so here, this is just a, in case many people probably aren't familiar with the framework or what we're looking at, but when we are evaluating each individual variant, we're looking at different um, metrics to say, do we think this is pathogenic or not? So one of the most powerful ones that we found is population data. So how common is this? Because if we see this in uh, you know 10% of the population, it's probably not causing a rare disease, right? Or is this only seen in patients with this variant or only in your family maybe even? Um, the computational and predictive data, so we can look at that, like is it predicted to be deleterious or do we know that this is a loss of function and that's the disease mechanism. Um, we also take into account functional studies that may have been done on a research or clinical basis, segregation, so are multiple affected families or family members. Is it de novo, because that is now the most common uh, mechanism for disease is de novo dominant. Um, and so on. And so we assign points to each variant as we're doing the interpretation. And this is how we're getting to that consensus of, yes, this is pathogenic, likely pathogenic, or that dreaded gray bucket of BUS. We don't have enough data to tell you. And I'm not going to read this slide, but I wanted to put it all um, because I knew this was being recorded is that these are some of the databases that are really, um, again, uh, that we use for our interpretation. Um, and particularly, again, I highlight the population controls because these are freely accessible um, population things that uh, databases that are kept up to date and they're very powerful. Um, particularly in a case if your um, disease cohort may be biased. So um, in our area, we are, are heavily biased to kind of a Northern European population um, and other centers may have a different um, ethnicity bias, but it makes a difference when you're looking at variation. So just to bring it all back together, um, and I kind of flew through really quickly, um, but I wanted to make sure we had it all in and had enough time, is that you know, next generation sequencing technologies are continuing to rapidly evolve. Um, and they'll, you'll see them pop up on the research side and then centers like ours that do research and clinical, we're able, and most centers are able to quickly move in that into the clinical realm. Um, broadly, your samples are treated the same um, between the platforms. Um, enrichment is allowing for deeper coverage at a lower cost, so that's where your panel sequencing and exome sequencing, but not all tests are created equal. So just because someone offers you an exome doesn't mean the exome at our lab is the same as an exome at a, a, another lab. And this is particularly important to remember and the caveat was, was your particular area of interest covered? Um, and again, the technology is going to change and we're getting increased diagnostic yields as we learn more about genomes and genetics and disease together as a community.
So then I just uh, will end with that and just acknowledge um, our team, our analytical team, and, and the director of our center, Dr. Tomu Pastanen, and of course, always our patients and families for their support and participation, participation, goodness, and um, I would be happy to answer any questions. Terrific job. Wow. Knock my socks off.